All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we're welcoming you to uh, the Bay State Health Annual Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. Uh, it's wonderful to have so many of you with us today. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us. Uh, my name is Heidi Zalai. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist here at Bay State's Cardiac Rehab and Wellness Program located in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, just a couple of reminders before we get started. Um, you can use the Q&A area of your um, Zoom presentation here to ask uh, questions, and we will review as many as possible at the end of our presentation today. Uh, and we just ask that you keep those questions uh, pertinent to our topic today. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Bull. Dr. Bull received his graduate undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. He attended medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, and remained there for training in general surgery. He subsequently completed fellowships in vascular surgery at the University of Arizona and cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Utah. Upon the completion of his fellowships, he joined the faculty at the University of Utah, ultimately becoming professor of surgery and chief of the division of cardiothoracic surgery. In 2017, he returned to the University of Arizona to become chief of the division of cardiothoracic surgery. He served in this position until 2023 when he was named chief of the division of cardiac surgery and vice president and medical director of the Heart and Vascular Service Line here at Bay State Health. So a fellow from the West joining us in the East, we welcome you, Dr. Bull, and we appreciate you being with us today. I'll hand it over to you. Heidi, thank you so much for the, that very kind introduction. And thank you to everybody online for joining me today. So during the course of this presentation, I'd like to provide an overview of four distinct areas within the broader field of cardiovascular surgery and provide you an overview of where we are currently and likely where I see innovation occurring over the next decade, both here at Bay State and throughout the country. So the first area we'll touch on is coronary artery disease and the surgical approach to it, aortic disease, and again, the surgical approach to it, what we can offer patients from a surgical standpoint in terms of management of end-stage heart failure, and finally, how we avoid really what is the most potentially devastating complication of any cardiac surgery, and that's stroke. So let's begin with coronary artery disease, commonly referred to as hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. It is the most common cause of death in the United States Nearly 700,000 patients a year die of this. Uh, it counts for nearly one in every four deaths. So it is a major public health problem. It's estimated there are currently 18 million Americans living with coronary artery disease today. And the impact on the health system is enormous. There's an, in, there's an estimated incidence of approximately 720,000 new and over 300,000 recurrent myocardial infarctions or heart attacks per year. So that's in some over a million a year. And so the, again, the stress on the healthcare system, the public health impact of this disease is enormous. Fortunately, there are many treatment options available for patients today. First is diet, exercise, risk factor modification. We can go from there to medical management. There are many options today for the lowering of blood pressure, cholesterol, major contributors to the incidence and pathogenesis of heart disease. We have a very sophisticated approach now uh, that our cardiologists use to open blood vessels that are partially blocked or reopen vessels that are completely blocked in the, in the case of uh, acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. And then there are surgical options, which are really reserved for those patients who cannot be managed with medical therapy or with percutaneous coronary interventions uh, and require a 
more uh, durable option uh, for treatment. So as we get into this, just to briefly review for everyone, the anatomy of the heart. We won't spend too much time on this, but just to have an understanding, uh, there are really three major blood vessels supplying the heart, the right coronary artery, the vessel that runs on the front of the heart, the left anterior descending coronary artery, and then one that wraps around the back of the heart, the so-called circumflex coronary artery. Now, normally these arteries are widely open and they serve to convey oxygenated red blood cells to the muscle of the heart to allow it to work effectively. When there is a buildup of plaque, however, in these arteries as a result of a sustained period of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, all of these risk factors or one or two of these in combination over time, the blood vessel can become narrowed. This is commonly referred to again as hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. If the narrowing is significant, typically more than about 70% of the diameter of the blood vessel, um, it can restrict the delivery of oxygenated red blood cells to the heart muscle, and that can result in chest pain when the patient's exerting him or herself, or if it's even more limiting, the patient may have symptoms of chest pain when they're merely sitting uh, or not performing any activity whatsoever. If the blood flow is acutely completely blocked, that can result in a heart attack or myocardial infarction. Now, as I mentioned, there are a series of interventions that can be made from optimizing medications to the placement of stents to the blood vessels. What we're going to talk about today is what's involved currently and what I see the future being for the surgical treatment or what is commonly referred to as coronary artery bypass grafting. And as the name implies, this involves placing bypasses using vessels from other parts of the body to go around or reroute the blood past the blockage to deliver oxygenated red blood cells to the heart muscle to allow it to perform effectively. Coronary artery bypass grafting, often referred to as cabbage, is the most common cardiac surgical procedure performed in the United States today. Uh, this has been true actually for several decades. It is indicated in patients who have disease in at least two, if not three blood vessels. So patients who have disease limited to one or two, typically today in 2024 are treated with the placement of stents. Uh, if patients have more extensive disease that is beyond the effective treatment with stents, then they'll typically be referred for a surgical intervention, which is again, coronary artery bypass grafting. So disease in multiple vessels, patients with diabetes seem to benefit from coronary artery bypass grafting, and patients whose heart muscle has declined in terms of its overall function, studies have shown can benefit from this procedure, the creation of new sources of blood supply to the heart beyond the blockages wherever they may occur in one or more of those major three blood vessels. So this gives you uh, a, an illustration of what this looks like in a practical sense. So we typically, as surgeons, use a combination of blood vessels to reroute blood supply to the heart, again, beyond the blockages, which may have built up over time. Typically, these blockages occur in the first or second portions of the heart, what we call the uh, blood vessels, rather, the proximal or mid portion. Uh, and so that, in most patients, allows us sites where we can place new blood vessels to reroute blood uh, to allow the heart muscle to receive enough uh, oxygen through the red blood cells delivered to that site. Typically, these blood vessels used are a combination of the vessel, the artery that runs on the inner part of the chest wall, the internal thoracic artery, and veins from the leg, the uh, saphenous vein graft. People often ask, well, 
isn't there a problem with removing the veins from the leg? How will blood return to the heart if you're taking the vein out? This is a superficial vein. It's not the deep vein, which is responsible for conveying blood back to the heart. And so these can be taken from the leg and used to route blood beyond the blockages in the blood in the blood vessels in the heart, the coronary arteries, and serve as effective conduits or bypass grafts uh, to those vessels. Now, uh, when the operation was first developed in the 1960s, or first described in the 1960s, um, the primary conduit used was this saphenous vein graft. In 1968, a surgeon by the name of George Green in New York City is credited with the first use of the artery from the inner part of a chest wall, the internal thoracic artery, and using that as a conduit or a vessel to bypass disease, uh, diseased uh, coronary arteries. Uh, throughout the 1970s, the operation was really uh, expanded in terms of the number of patients to whom it was applied. Much of that credit goes to a surgeon by the name of Rene Favalaro, originally from Argentina, but practiced at the Cleveland Clinic. And he was, and his team at the Cleveland Clinic were really the ones who demonstrated that this could be applied to a large number of patients. And from there, that experience extended throughout the United States. In the 1980s and 1990s, a series of studies looked at the outcomes following coronary artery bypass grafting and also looked at what was the likelihood that these bypasses would stay open over time and found that, in fact, if you looked at a decade's worth of experience, that patients who had an internal thoracic artery graft used as the conduit for the bypass grafting uh, typically had uh, better overall survival compared to those patients who only had vein bypasses placed. And that over 90% of these arteries used as bypass conduits or grafts were still open after a decade. That compared to an analysis and a series of analyses which showed that the veins typically stayed open at a rate of about 50% over 10 years and that they were much more likely to close over time. Reasons for this are numerous. Uh, we know that these vein bypasses are likely less hardy, if you will, uh, less resilient uh, than the artery itself, that is the internal thoracic artery. They're more susceptible to damage, for instance, from cigarette smoking. So if you have a bypass operation, you continue to smoke, the likelihood is that those vein bypass grafts previously placed may occlude over time. They also seem to be more susceptible to other risk factors, which if all modified can lead to uh, graft closure, including hypertension, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol. So as a result of that accumulating medical information, from the studies of the outcomes of patients undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting, a realization uh, set up in the cardiac surgery and cardiology community that patients who undergo coronary artery bypass grafting with arterial grafts actually survive longer and the grafts perform uh, at a much higher efficiency. And so that's led to the concept that maybe we shouldn't be limiting the use of arterial grafts as conduits to just one, the internal thoracic artery, most commonly from the left side, but extend, extend that to the placement of multiple arteries instead of relying as much as we have in the past on the placement of veins. And so this is currently the uh, question posed by a study which is underway to which Bay State has contributed significantly the Roma trial. And this is the randomized comparison of the clinical outcome of single versus multiple arterial grafts. Uh, the original parent trial, if you will, has finished enrollment. And so follow-up is now being done and analyzed. But Bay State is still actively enrolling 
female patients because we want to understand how the benefits of this procedure can be extended to women in particular, uh, women with heart disease, and can they show the same benefit that we may see in male patients. So again, we're currently enrolling for the uh, Roma W trial, which is looking at the placement of multiple arterial grafts in female patients. And this is what we're talking about. So think about uh, what we saw before, where you have the use of the internal thoracic artery from the left side placed to the left anterior descending coronary artery beyond an obstruction in that vessel. Now, with multiple arterial grafting, what we're talking about, what we're doing here at Bay State, is using other arteries as well instead of veins. So now the right internal thoracic artery routed behind the aorta and pulmonary artery to the circumflex artery, the one that runs on the back of the heart. Taking the artery from the arm, the radial artery, and transposing that to, for instance, the right coronary artery. So you can perform multi-vessel coronary artery bypass grafting now, and we do this at Bay State using multiple arteries. And again, the ultimate long-term durability and outcomes of this are currently uh, being uh, studied in the Roma trial. Let's move on to another area where we have tremendous expertise here at Bay State and an area which likely will also see significant innovation over the next decade, and that's aortic disease. What we're talking about here are patients who have enlargement or dilation of the aorta, the major blood vessel emerging off of the heart that conveys blood to the rest of the body, um, or patients who have tears in the aorta. Uh, these patients, both groups of patients, have to be treated with surgery at the present time. But what's on the horizon, I want to discuss with you uh, today, are endovascular approaches, which uh, do not require open surgery uh, and the use of a heart-lung machine to correct the patient's problem. So aneurysms, again, are dilations or abnormal enlargements of the uh, aorta, the major blood vessel, which conveys blood to the rest of the body uh, as it emerges from uh, the left ventricle, where the blood has been oxygenated and then ejected to the rest of the body. So once that ascending aorta enlarges beyond a certain diameter, typically 5 to 5.5 centimeters, we know that those patients are more predisposed to having tears develop, dissections, which we'll talk about in a moment, or ruptures or other complications. And so we intervene surgically to correct that problem to prevent those complications from occurring. And that's typically referred to as an aortic aneurysm repair. Now, currently in 2024, here at Bay State, we perform this procedure with open surgery using the heart-lung machine. Typically, we'll have to cool the patient uh, down to uh, help protect their brain uh, during the course of the procedure. And these can be very extensive operations. They may require not only replacement of the aorta uh, as it uh, uh, dilates above the level of the coronary arteries, which we talked about before, but may also require replacement of the aorta all the way down to the aortic valve and reimplantation of those vessels. So these can be very uh, extensive, technically demanding operations. Aortic dissection is another subset of problems that people couldn't develop uh, if they have typically enlargement or an aneurysm of the aorta or excessive high blood pressure or other predisposing factors, some of which can be inherited. Dissection is different than an aneurysm. Again, an aneurysm is an abnormal dilation of the aorta beyond a certain size, 5 to 5.5 centimeters. Dissection can occur in a patient with an aneurysm, also can occur at lesser diameters of the aorta. Really what that is, is a tear in the aorta that occurs within the middle layer of the aorta, the media, between the inner and outer aspects of the media, the muscular part of the aorta, 
And a tear in that area leads to a what we call a dissection. And that can lead to a patient's death in uh, within several hours, uh, if not sooner, as a result of compromise of the aortic valve, the coronary arteries, or frank rupture into the pericardium and uh, immediate uh, shock and, and then loss of life. These operations, as is true with aneurysm or perhaps even more so, are technically demanding. You have to repair the tear in the aorta, often resuspending uh, that tissue with the uh, intent of preserving the function of the valve. These tears can extend throughout the aortic arch into the descending thoracic aorta and may require a period of time where the surgeon has to stop the blood flow uh, to the brain in order to effectively uh, cool the patient down, stop the blood flow to the brain in order to effectively replace uh, the aortic arch in particular. And these operations uh, typically will involve replacement of the entire ascending aorta. In some circumstances, if the aortic valve or coronary arteries are compromised, uh, that part of the aorta immediately adjacent to heart may have to be replaced as well. And so these can be very complex repairs. Sometimes in some patients, however, uh, despite all the expertise of the surgeons here at Bay State, you can be encountered with a um, situation in which even surgical repair is extremely challenging or not feasible. And this is an example I'm going to show you just for illustration purposes of some of the uh, challenges that you can face as a surgeon and what are some of the new options that are emerging on the horizon. So this is a patient who has this white material here, extensive calcification of the aorta, and they've got this bulge off of the aorta here uh, following a prior repair. And this is what we refer to as a pseudoaneurysm uh, because it's uh, a weakening in a particular area, a limited area of the aorta, but nevertheless can carry a high potential for complications. This degree of calcification extending throughout the aorta into the aortic arch prevents significant technical challenges to a surgeon because this calcification can make it almost impossible to place a graft to substitute for the aneurysm and the disease portion of the aorta. How are you going to approach something like this? Well, there are new solutions on the horizon, which I hope uh, we'll be implementing uh, in the years ahead here at Bay State. So this is a means to replace the ascending aorta uh, without having to use standard open surgery in a heart-lung machine. This is instead reliant on principles of endovascular surgery, where we're placing grafts within the blood vessel, in this case, within the aorta, to um, correct the aneurysm or dissection. This is referred to as an endoprosthesis, endovascular prosthesis. It's given the name Bentol uh, after uh, the surgeon who helped uh, first describe the open surgical repair. But this procedure is done, again, without the technique of open standard surgery and a heart-lung machine. How do we do this? Well, uh, what you do and... Uh, hope that you can uh, see this here. Um, they approach this, placing a wire from the tip of the heart, the apex of the heart, pass it through into the aorta, and then uh, through that wire, using a series of changes and uh, catheters, can place a graft and a valve into the ascending aorta. That graft has openings in it that allows subsequent placement of a series of stent grafts uh, that allow blood flow to be routed to the coronary arteries, essentially accomplishing the same thing you can accomplish with surgery. Here's an illustration of what I'm talking about. So this is done uh, approaching the uh, aorta through the apex of the heart, passing a series of catheters up uh, into the ascending aorta, allowing the placement of a heart valve with a graft, and then the remainder of the graft attached to that, openings off of this graft to allow the placement of extended uh, prostheses, grafts, into the coronary arteries to route blood in that way. So that's something that 
given the combined efforts of our cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, and vascular surgeons at Bay State, I believe will be something that we'll be offering in the future as an alternative to open surgery for select patients. Just to show you that this has been reported in the medical literature and works, um, you see here, this is four month follow-up of this patient. Uh, they've got an open graft to their right coronary artery, left coronary artery coming off of this uh, endoprosthesis. And then here's the graft here. You don't have to chip through the calcium. It's all placed from the inside uh, and addresses the patient's problem, keeps the aneurysm from the pseudoaneurysm from growing any larger, allows the patient to return to their normal activities in a um, relatively short hospital stay. All right, let's move on to the third topic, which is end-stage heart failure. What do we mean by end-stage heart failure? Well, end-stage heart failure refers to those patients who have compromised pumping function of the heart, in particular the left ventricle, as a result of repeated heart attacks or inherited conditions or primary conditions of the heart muscle. There's a variety of potential etiologies, um, but their heart muscle no longer works effectively. They're not able to eject blood to the rest of the body because the heart muscle has become so weakened. Um, for those patients, uh, there's many medical therapies that are available, but a subsection of those patients will work through their medical therapies and remain with very poor compromised heart function despite optimal medical therapies. And at that point, as surgeons, we can offer mechanical circulatory support, the placement of devices to help augment the pumping function of the heart. And many of you may have heard the term left ventricular assist device or LVAD, and that's really what we're talking about here. This is an example, just an illustration of what this involves. So you've got um, a device, which is again placed at the apex of the heart. And then that captures blood that otherwise would be in the left ventricle and routes it through this graft up to the ascending aorta, essentially compensating for or taking up the function of the left ventricle, which can no longer perform that activity because it's become so weakened over time. Again, as a result of either repeated heart attacks, which is depleted the heart muscle, replaced it with scar, or an inherited condition which can run in families, which leads to weakening of the heart muscle or viral diseases. There's a whole number of reasons why this may happen. Uh, this is an example of the current state of the art, uh, the HeartMate 3. Uh, the HeartMate 3 LVAD uh, is an endothoracic pump, so it's placed within the chest. It uh, works as a result of a fully magnetically levitated motor. It's a centrifugal pump system, if you will. It offers a form of artificial pulsatility, and it really uh, allows the delivery of, if necessary, all of the patient's blood flow from the left ventricle uh, to the uh, rest of the body through the graft to the ascending aorta. These devices have become small enough that they no longer require that the sternum be completely divided. In fact, I've placed these devices through using these limited incisions, which you see here uh, in the uh, fourth or fifth intercostal space. The device is placed here and then routed uh, using the uh, uh, through another incision here up to the ascending aorta. And so the incisions are more limited the recovery time is faster in the hospital, uh, and the patient can return their usual activities much more quickly. The trend uh, with these devices, these left ventricular assist devices, as they've become smaller and more user-friendly and more durable over time, is that more and more of them are being replaced, are being placed, not with the intention to bridge the patient to a heart transplant, but in fact, as the permanent form of therapy for this patient, so-called destination therapy. So these are patients for whom a heart transplant is really not part of their medical future as a result of age or other medical conditions that the patient has. 
And you see here, this is through 2019 data, uh, you see the upward trend and more and more of these patients are having these devices placed with the intention that the device is really going to be permanent for these patients. It's not going to be placed as a bridge, if you will, or an interim solution to getting a heart transplant. That does occur for some patients, but more and more of the trend in the United States, these are meant to be the permanent long-term, the patient's permanent long-term solution for their heart failure. They say, well, how can that be? Is, is, that, is that realistic? And in fact, that is. There are uh, patients who now have received the HeartMate 2, the prior iteration of the device, who are alive 14 to 15 years after the placement of that device. Now, you compare that to a technology such as heart transplantation. In heart transplantation, we regard our, our success as being a patient who lives beyond eight years with a heart transplant. That's really the marker that in the heart transplant programs that I was involved in at Utah, Arizona, that's what we would use as our benchmark, eight years. Well, now with devices, uh, you may in select patients be able to meet or even exceed that. And that's a very exciting uh, uh, potential for patients because the number of donors for hearts in the United States really has not changed in almost 30 years. It's just under 3,000 uh, organ donors for hearts in the United States uh, over that period of time. Keep in mind that while that level has plateaued, the overall population in the United States has increased by 20 to 30 percent during that period of time. So uh, on a net basis, the actual number of donors for the population has actually gone down. So we clearly need another solution. And I believe that this is something that we're going to be adopting more and more here at Bay State, as we're seeing around the country. So from left to right, this gives you the history of the development of these left ventricular assist devices. So on the left is the HeartMate 1. This is what these devices were like in the mid-1990s. And I placed a lot of these devices into patients. And they were life-saving. But they were typically placed with the intention that the uh, patient was going to be bridged to a heart transplant. So you would place this device, you'd have an interval period of time, typically anywhere from six months to a year, year and a half, at which time the patient's device would be removed and they'd receive a heart transplant. These, are, these were long, difficult uh, operations. This device had a way of uh, getting... Uh, uh, into other parts of the body, in particular the abdomen, where it was uh, placed on top of, it would sometimes erode through the peritoneum and become encased in the intestines. So getting these things out could be a real challenge. Um, the HeartMate 2, this device here, uh, was the successor. It's an axial flow pump. It requires significant anticoagulation had significant issues around the potential for bleeding with patients, clot formation, but it was a real advance over the heart mate wad, in particular because of its durability. Again, there are patients reported to uh, be alive 14 or 15 years after placement of a heart mate 2, uh, significant advance over the heart mate 1. And again, if you compare that to what our benchmark is for heart transplantation, that's a pretty favorable trade-off for some patients, especially patients who are not good candidates for immunosuppression for a whole variety of reasons. The successor to the HeartMate 2 is the HeartMate 3, this device here. And you can see with each successive generation, the device is becoming smaller and smaller, which makes it easier to implant. Uh, and also, as, as a result, it seems to be more durable. The HeartMate 3, as I mentioned earlier, uh, allows, unlike the HeartMate 2, a degree of artificial pulsatility. It's much more uh, favorable in terms of the patient's overall hemodynamics. It's much better tolerated. There's fewer side effects or complications. HeartMate 3 is a real game changer. And I think that these devices in particular, although they have not been implanted as long, likely will meet or exceed the durability and resilience that we've seen with the HeartMate 2. Now, what's on the horizon is the HeartMate 4. And you'll notice that this is really almost 150th the size 
in terms of weight and overall volume of the heart make once. So the progress over uh, almost 30 years has been remarkable. This is not necessarily a full replacement for the left ventricle, um, but it can offer partial unloading uh, enough to allow a patient to have two, three liters of flow a minute, which is enough to augment the function of their left ventricle, that the patient can have a significant reduction in their medications, much less likelihood that they have to be hospitalized for heart failure and get back to a reasonable quality of life. What's coming with the HeartMate 4 in all likelihood is also a much lower likelihood that they'll need an external drive line and that they'll have a fully implantable battery source. So uh, no need for an external energy source for the device. Now that's yet to be released. This is purely what I hear when I talk to the engineers, but this would be a game changer because the Achilles heel, if you will, if there is one with these devices, is that they require an external drive line, even the HeartMate 3, external battery source. And so these are areas where the device has the potential to fail. If you have a fully implantable device along the lines of something like a pacemaker or an internal cardioverted fibrillator, uh, you now have a device which can be predicted to be durable for many, many years, many fewer complications, much better tolerated by the patients, much better satisfaction for their families, um, this is likely what's on the horizon. I think it's a very exciting opportunity for us here at Bay State and for all the patients that we treat in the western half of Massachusetts. All right, so regardless of the type of surgery that we've talk talked about, coronary artery bypass grafting, aortic surgery, placement of left ventricular assist devices, the complication that we as cardiac surgeons fear above all others is the occurrence of a stroke uh, during or following the surgery. Um, why is this important? Well, patients who have a stroke at the time of their surgery during their hospitalization uh, have a five to tenfold higher risk of dying during that hospitalization. It markedly increases the cost of the hospitalization and markedly prolongs the patient length of stay. And also patients who suffer a stroke uh, have been documented to have an increased risk of cognitive decline one year following their surgery. For most patients, stroke is the most feared complication of cardiac surgery. It's the leading reason I hear from patients that they don't want to have cardiac surgery, even though it can markedly prolong their lives and improve their quality of life. But when you talk to them, most patients will actually sacrifice longevity for freedom from stroke. People are aware, they've seen it in family members, people they've known, people fear this complication, surgeons fear this complication. Fortunately, there have been major developments uh, that I'll, I'll be able to share with you today to prevent this complication. So what is the overall risk? Well, for patients having coronary artery bypass grafting or valve repair or replacement alone, it's about 1%. It goes up to 2 to 3% if those procedures are combined. Aortic surgery, which we were talking about earlier, has a higher risk of stroke, not unexpected given the fact that you're operating on the major blood vessel that supplies blood to the brain. It's 3 to up to 9% for aortic surgeries. And it's also higher for that group of patients who have the new onset of a condition, an abnormal rhythm, following surgery called atrial fibrillation. So it's a major risk factor for our patients even today and one that we're committed to really wiping out if at all possible. So who's at risk for a stroke with heart surgery? So older patients, those over the age of 65, patients with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if they have diabetes, if they're active cigarette smoking, uh, actively smoking cigarettes, if they have heart failure, kidney disease, uh, chronic atrial fibrillation before surgery, or have had a stroke or what's called a transient ischemic attack, which is a mini stroke, if you will, uh, in the past. But there are a lot of ways that we can prevent this complication here in 2024 that we didn't have in the past. So, so the first is the use of 
echocardiography, ultrasound of the heart. The anesthesiologists here at Bay State are truly expert uh, at this technique, and they can survey the heart, scan the heart once the patient's asleep to determine if there's any clots uh, present, anything that might put the patient at risk for a thrombus or embolus that would travel up to the brain during or after the surgery and have notify the surgeon and take appropriate steps to modify the operation to reduce the likelihood that this might happen. In addition, the surgeons here at Bay State routinely use an ultrasound imaging of the aorta, typically referred to as epiaortic ultrasound, to look for areas of plaque formation, similar to what we talked about in the coronary arteries. It can also occur in the aortas we saw uh, in the description of the endobental prosthesis uh, example, and scan the aorta to look for sites that are free of plaque or calcification, or if they're too extensive, look for an alternative site uh, to place a cannula for uh, the use of the heart-lung machine. The anesthesiologists here at Bay State routinely use cerebral oximetry so they can measure the oxygen supply uh, to the brain on the right and left side to make sure that uh, the brain is receiving adequate nutrient blood flow. Uh, they're expert at monitoring the patient's blood pressure to make sure it does not rise to a high level. And also the anesthesiologists and the surgeons together closely monitor the blood loss and assess the need for transfusing blood to the patient should this become necessary. So what do we do if we suspect a patient may have a stroke? Well, the first thing is uh, to be able to examine the patient following surgery. So you take all those risk factors that we talked about, and if you, as a surgeon, and an anesthesiologist determined that, in fact, based on the accumulation of these risk factors, that this patient is a high risk for a stroke during or after surgery, we often will place them on a fast track protocol where they have their breathing tube removed shortly after surgery to be able to examine them from a neurologic standpoint to determine whether or not they have any signs or symptoms of a stroke. That involves performing as complete a neurologic examination uh, as possible after surgery. We have a stroke team in place here at Bay State. So if in fact we believe that a patient has suffered a stroke, we can activate that team to uh, prevent, uh, potentially um, uh, address that stroke and hopefully mitigate the effects of it, ideally reverse the effects of it. And so the first step that we typically employ here at Bay State is a CT scan of the head and a CT study of the blood vessels in the neck and brain to determine if a stroke may have occurred. Um, if the patient's uh, no longer in the intensive care unit, we transfer them back to the intensive care unit. The intent of that is to optimize brain oxygenation and perfusion, and then with the assistance of the stroke team, look to uh, assess whether or not this patient is a candidate for a, an acute neurovascular intervention, in particular, a mechanical obstruction of the embolus or thrombus that is causing the stroke. This is something that's been a revolution over the last decade and really transformed the uh, treatment of patients having strokes in all settings, but particularly after cardiac surgery. So the purpose of the CT scan is to make sure that the patient's stroke is not a result of a ruptured blood vessel. In this circumstance, then supportive measures are necessary, lowering blood pressure, uh, other interventions that the um, neurologist will recommend from a medical standpoint. If a CT angiogram or magnetic resonance angiogram, in fact, demonstrates that there's an occlusion of the distal internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery or middle cerebral artery, and the patient has an ongoing deficit, that is something that can actively be treated in 2024. This can be done with the use of uh, devices, including snares to extract a clot, as you see here, or coil systems that can um, uh, remove a clot and restore blood flow and hopefully reverse the signs of an evolving stroke. This is what it looks like. This is an acute occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery here as a result of a clot. 
Um, the uh, patient had a uh, stent retrieval system placed uh, into the artery and extracted this clot, resulting in a restoration of blood flow to the anterior cerebral artery and a complete reversal of their symptoms of stroke. Truly uh, a life-saving measure for that patient for all the reasons that we talked about. Here's another example, an even more proximal occlusion. This is the distal internal carotid artery shutting off blood flow to the entire cerebral hemisphere, that half of the brain. These are all the clots that were extracted uh, during the course of the procedure and a complete restoration of blood flow to the middle and anterior cerebral arteries off of the internal carotid artery. Truly amazing uh, that you can have a restoration of blood flow and reverse the signs of an evolving stroke. So I'll just conclude with the fact that advances in cardiovascular surgery continue to bring innovations to patients with cardiovascular disease, allowing them to live longer lives with a better quality of life, and in particular with the ability to intervene for potentially the worst complication of the cardiac surgery. We've made major advances. And so for that reason, patients and their families should feel much more confident about um, the services we have here at Bay State in cardiology, vascular surgery, cardiac surgery, to improve the quality of life for patients with cardiovascular disease. And with that, I'll conclude, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bull. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I can speak certainly here in cardiac rehab that we are thrilled to hear these things that um, are on the horizon for um, patients. Uh, really helping with the quality of life, the longevity of, of patients is, we're so excited to hear about these new technologies. Um, a few questions that we do have. Um, the first one um, is regarding uh, laparoscopic bypass. And the question is, when will Bay State have laparoscopic bypass heart surgery available? So uh, by laparoscopic, I would assume that the uh, the person is referring to minimally invasive techniques. So there's a variety of ways this can be done. So um, there are limited incisions uh, that we, we can use for um, valve surgeries or uh, repairing uh, holes in the heart, atrial septal defects in particular. Um, there's also robotics, uh, which can be applied to heart surgery um, using an intuitive surgical system. Uh, to harvest, for instance, the internal mammary artery and then graft that without having to perform a formal division of the breastbone without putting the patient on the heart-lung machine. Those surgeries, uh, having participated in those myself, they, they can be challenging, in particular the robotic surgery. And we always have to balance the potential to offer a patient a minimally invasive approach with what is the optimal surgical correction for their coronary artery disease? What do I mean? So for patients who have disease limited to one blood vessel, in particular the vessel that runs on the front of their heart, their left anterior descending, this may be a solution. Uh, again, it avoids the division of the breastbone. You have a series of smaller incisions uh, uh, adjacent to the breastbone through the spaces between the ribs. But uh, the ability to offer patients multi-vessel grafting is much more limited with a robotic approach. So um, that's still, uh, you know, a technology which is in evolution in terms of applications. I think it will continue to evolve. But, you know, quite honestly, our cardiologists are so expert at stenting patients with uh, disease and one or more blood vessels that I view that as the optimal solution for patients who have disease that's more limited that may be treated with a uh, less invasive approach right now. Uh, we'll see how the technology evolves, but uh, right now it's, uh, it's very much in development. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, this next question, um, the uh, right internal thoracic artery and left internal thoracic artery graphs appear much uh, narrower the vessel size itself, itself, it seems, than the artery being bypassed. Uh, does this decrease volume impact or quality of life or health? 
It doesn't. In fact, um, although it may look that way from the diagram, the, it turns out that actually the internal thoracic artery on the right or left side is actually a much better size match to the arteries of the heart, which typically have a diameter of around three millimeters. So, uh, you know, the surgeons, when they're doing this procedure, will use uh, telescopic magnification uh, two to three fold to see these vessels and perform the anastomoses or the sewing of the blood vessels together. The, in my experience, and I think they would agree, the other uh, surgeons in the group, that the internal thoracic arteries are much better size match than the uh, veins, which can be substantially larger than the arteries. And therefore, actually, the flow dynamics are better. And that's actually one of the hypotheses as to why the arteries perform better over the time, because there's a much better match between the vessels. And not to get too technical about this, but what can happen when there's a mismatch in the size of the vessels, as there can be between the vein and the artery, the vein often being substantially larger, is that there's a disruption in the flow dynamics, especially at that interface where the vein is sewn to the artery. And as a result, the body can compensate as with, with a buildup of material uh, called intimal hyperplasia uh, that will correct the flow dynamics but can lead to obstruction and we believe ultimate closure of the graft over time or certainly narrowing. And so actually the arteries are better, the internal thoracic arteries are actually a better size match to the coronary arteries of the heart. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this next question um, is referring to quote unquote pump head um, or otherwise known as um, post perfusion syndrome. Is that a common after effect of uh, bypass surgery? Not something I've heard of. Well, it is it is a term that that has been around for a long time. We think that the uh, major contributor to that was material that embolized or traveled from the aorta or from the heart up to the head, causing compromised blood flow in the terminal portions of the vessels in the brain, and. Pump head refers to, it's a common term used to refer to patients whose cognition, their ability to reason, remember, reflect, recognize family members, it was compromised after heart surgery. This is an excellent question because it gets to it exactly what I was addressing during the talk, these new imaging modalities. So uh, echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart, which the anesthesiologists are expert here at Bay State of performing, or the scanning of the aorta looking for uh, plaque or calcification, really is both of these imaging modalities are designed to reduce the likelihood that material will break off from the heart or from the aorta and go to the head and cause these complications. And as a result of the implementation of these on a routine basis, the overall likelihood of compromise of cognition following heart surgery is reduced dramatically. So it's an excellent question, but the imaging modalities that I mentioned during the course of the presentation are, are really designed to uh, 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 intercede on that and I think have been quite successful. So the, the number of patients we see with that issue is markedly reduced compared to even 10 years ago. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this last question, um, I know some of this has been answered, uh, I believe, in our first lecture series of the uh, the month that Dr. Goldschweig did. But can you just touch on uh, and maybe um, possibly list um, any advances in the non-invasive treatments? The uh, non-invasive treatment. So, so is that referring to, for instance, uh, placements of devices in the left atrium to... I, Claude, yes. I would assume so, something of that nature. Tower. Yeah, so, so um, Dr. Goldschweig, I know, uh, is an expert on this nationally. He actually leads this effort uh, nationally uh, and is an, an expert on this. But we now have these devices can, which can be placed via catheter uh, for patients, for instance, with atrial fibrillation to keep clot. Uh, from embolizing out of the heart and causing a stroke, uh, the one that's probably most most well known is the so-called Watchman device. Uh, but there's another there's other devices which uh, Dr. Goldschweig is leading the trials 
for here at Bay State, uh, these have been game changers in terms of reducing patients' risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation in particular. What can happen with atrial fibrillation is that you can, because of the abnormal pumping function that sets up, um, there's an area in the heart, the left atrial appendage, which can be predisposed to develop clot in patients who have longstanding atrial fibrillation. If that clot breaks free, it can cause a stroke. Uh, devices that are placed there uh, can keep that from happening and also markedly reduce the patient's need for anticoagulation. So they have been a major advance as well. Um, a couple other questions here. Um, sorry, all the lectures, yes, will be I have been recorded and you can actually revisit them. Um, that was one of the questions that somebody had had. Um, so you can revisit the, the lectures that we've had previously. Um, just one other question, um, kind of going back to the beginning part of your presentation, um, talked about uh, kind of surgery versus having stents placed. What is your determination uh, for somebody, whether they're um, a better candidate for stents? I know you talked about the number of vessels that were compromised, um, but where do you determine, okay, somebody's a better candidate for surgery versus having stents? So that determination is made by their cardiologist in conjunction with a cardiac surgeon, there we know from multiple studies that there are particular groups of patients who benefit from bypass surgery, by which I mean bypass surgery can extend their life. And those patients are patients who have disease in all three of their blood vessels, again, the right coronary artery, left anterior descending, circumflex, uh, particularly if those are high-grade obstructions, so blockages of more than 70%. Um, patients who have diabetes and have disease in multiple vessels, the studies indicate that they live longer if they have bypass surgery, uh, uh, not necessarily as a first option, but at some point can truly extend their lives. Patients whose heart function has already been compromised and have disease in two or three blood vessels, particularly with high-grade obstructions or high-grade lesions can benefit from bypass surgery. So those are the subgroups. Now, this is not all the patients. Obviously, more patients, many more patients with obstructions than coronaries are treated with the placement of stents than bypass surgery, and that's appropriate. But we do know from medical studies, the medical literature, that there are these particular subgroups of patients who will live longer with bypass surgery. So it's a, it's a decision made between the patient and their family and the cardiologist in conjunction with the advice of a cardiac surgeon as to what's the best course for that particular patient. Perfect. We love that everybody's you know dealt with individually based on their situation. Yes. Everybody's great. situation is different. Absolutely. Super. Um, just one last question about um, the HeartMate 4, which we would love to see as soon as possible. Any idea how long that might be? Um, before we actually see that in use? That's a great question. It's a bit of a moving target. I follow it very closely because uh, the, let me just say that the, each iteration of the HeartMate has been a substantial uh, leap forward. So HeartMate 2 to HeartMate 1, substantial improvement. HeartMate 3 to HeartMate 2, even more improvement. And so everybody's anxiously looking for HeartMate 4, forward to that. Um, I think the estimates currently are uh, 2026. Um, I want to make sure here at Bay State we're adequately positioned for that because, again, given the durability that we've seen with just HeartMate 2 and likely what we're going to see with HeartMate 3, we can forecast that for HeartMate 4. Again, a device that's that small, 1 50th of the size of the HeartMate 1 uh, 30 years ago, and um, durable without external drive lines and internal battery source, you could see patients, uh, many patients who aren't candidates for transplantations, really benefit from this and potentially live a decade or more. Um, I think it's very exciting and the future is very bright in this area. Fantastic. We absolutely agree with you. It's been wonderful to see the transition um, over time with patients and what Base has been able to do to, to help these patients as best as possible. We appreciate it. Um, well, that is it for the questions that we have um, today. We certainly thank you for your time um, on this Sunday and, and really appreciate all the new interventions that you're talking about and everything that's on the horizon. A lot to 
to look forward to in, in helping to save so many lives um, when it comes to the heart and, and vascular system. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, and we hope to see you next week. Um, if you would like to register for next week's topic, um, they're talking about uh, some of the pharmaceuticals for weight loss, um, Ozempic and some of the others, um, please register uh, through the Bay State website. Um, and again, you can view any of these others uh, that we've had in the past um, on the Bay State website um, as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.